Hello, my name is Matan, and in this video, we'll go over PID and PIV controllers and tuning in the frequency domain. In this tutorial, we'll be covering PID and PIV controllers and the difference between them, what a general motor model looks like, what we want from our controller, and we'll identify a dynamic system and tune its PIV parameters. I'll be using an AGD200 and an AXD120 which is an Acrobus rotary motor, for this demo. PID is a well-known control scheme which has three terms, proportional, integral, and derivative. Each term acts on the position error in different ways and outputs the desired current from the motor. The proportional term demands current proportionally to the size of the error, so you can, for example, raise it to get a faster response to error. The integral term sums the errors, so it helps quicken the response, track the target, and make sure the steady state of the system has no errors. The derivative term demands current relatively to how fast the errors change. So if there's a sharp change in error, the derivative term quickly reacts to it before the error gets too big. These parameters are usually tuned in the time domain, while looking at the system's step response, for example. In this video, we're going to be tuning our control parameters in the frequency domain. However, we also have time domain tools for tuning, if you prefer. Tuning the control parameters while looking at the frequency response can be very insightful. You can see the stability margins and bandwidth directly, among other things. PIV is an equivalent control scheme to PID that's simply easier to tune in the frequency domain. Let's look at the transfer functions of both control schemes to see why. We get a second order polynomial with an integral. That's not clear at all how changing one parameter will affect the system's frequency response. Also, the system's rise time and overshoot are highly coupled. Trying to improve one can negatively affect the other, which is not the case in the PIV control scheme. For the PIV, we essentially added another loop. The outermost loop is the position loop, then there's the added velocity loop. This architecture adds a clear advantage over PID control in applications where different feedbacks are used for the position and velocity loops. For example, the position loop is fed by an encoder and the velocity loop by a gyrometer. We see that the PIV parameters are just two zeros, an integral, and a gain. That's why it's much easier to tune this controller in the frequency domain as opposed to PID. If we solve the PID's second order polynomial and equate the roots to the PIV roots, we'll be able to find equivalent controllers in PIV and PID forms, as long as the PID roots aren't complex. And if you wish to use PID tuning parameters, you can also do that in our tuning page. To get a basic model of the motor, we'll focus on the mechanical part and neglect the electrical terms as they occur at a much higher frequency. Here's the torque acting on a motor shaft, neglecting the spring torque. So when performing an identification on a motor, we'd expect to get the behavior of an integral and a pole, at lower frequencies at least. Let's run a pseudo-random binary sequence identification of a rotary motor, the AXD120 by Acrobis. The identification setup is very simple. I'm just choosing what current to inject, what frequency to start measuring from, and begin. As you can see, the identification process injects current for about half a second. And that's it. We see here a Bode plot which is very similar to a Bode plot of an integrator and a pole. In the gain plot, we have a minus 20 dB per decade slope at lower frequencies, which turns into minus 40 dB per decade around the pole frequency. In the phase plot, we have a minus 90 degrees phase from the integrator, which is gradually decreasing by an additional 90 degrees from the pole. Notice that the system doesn't converge to minus 180 degrees phase, as would be expected from an integrator and a pole. This is because we have other components in the system especially at higher frequencies, that we neglected in our approximate model. Let's click now on Go to Auto-Tune to go to the design page where we'll be able to tune our controller. 
First of all, we can simply specify the bandwidth we want and click on Run Auto-Tune to get a good initial estimate for the control parameters. But we'll be tuning our parameters manually in this video to gain a deeper understanding of the parameters' effects on the system behavior. But before we continue and tune our controller, what would be considered a good controller? Let's take a minute to look at the Gang of Four to get a better understanding. The Gang of Four are a group of transfer functions that show the relationship between the external and internal signals of interest in our system, assuming no feedforward elements. I recommend watching Brian Douglas's video on the topic for more details. Link in the description. So here are the Gang of Four. There are four distinct transfer functions. Let's focus on our specific case. We'll assume for now that we have very little noise and that we want good reference tracking and good disturbance rejection. We'll get to the noise later. The transfer function that dictates how well we'll follow the reference signal is this one. We want this transfer function to be close to one. That means we want the one to be negligible. So we'll try to make PC, our open loop transfer function, as large as possible. And the transfer function that dictates how well we'll reject disturbances is this one. We want this transfer function to be very small, meaning PC needs to be much greater than P, or C needs to be very large. I'm going to aim for a bandwidth of around 50 Hz, 50 degrees phase margin, and 6 dB gain margin. Let's start tuning. Let's start with all PIV parameters as 1s and go to the open loop plot. We see that I don't even have a crossover frequency. So let's first increase the gain until my crossover frequency meets my desired bandwidth. The gain at low frequencies is still pretty low. Let's increase it by raising the zero parameters. The zero gain is calculated like this. At low frequencies, the omega portion doesn't add much. And if our alpha is small, it won't add much either. So to increase the gain at lower frequencies, we can increase alpha. Let's increase alpha until we reach around 60 degrees phase margin. Notice that the phase margin is slowly falling, because when the zero was at a low frequency, it added around 90 degrees phase to frequencies that were more than a decade above it. Now, as we're increasing the zero's frequency, it's adding less and less phase at the same frequencies. Let's increase the frequency of the second zero as well, since we don't need phase margin at lower frequencies. I'll stop when I reach 50 degrees phase margin. In our tuning, we ignored any noise present. But if we look at the transfer function that dictates how the noise affects the actual position, we want this transfer function to be as small as possible to attenuate any noise, which is the exact opposite of what we wanted in tracking the reference signal. The key point here is that there's always a trade-off between the requirements. Luckily, significant noise usually appears at higher frequencies. So these requirements can coincide. A high gain at frequencies below the bandwidth and a low gain at frequencies above the bandwidth. To help us lower the gain even more at higher frequencies, we can use a second order low pass filter on the velocity loop. I'll choose a high enough frequency that won't affect the gain at the frequencies where we want good reference tracking and disturbance rejection. If we go down here, we see we can look at the Nichols plot and also look at the input disturbance response and the measurement noise response. But for now, let's look at the closed loop response. Notice that if I lower the zero frequency, which means more phase margin, the peak of the closed loop response is reduced. So we get a more dampened system. However, the bandwidth is lowered. Again, a trade-off. That's it for this video. If you have any need for precise servo systems, feel free to contact us. Details below.
Thanks for watching and see you next time.